It's time to step into the Coming Out Lounge, a cool, safe space to be true to your sexual self. With your host, Rick Clemens. Rick has helped hundreds of people come out of the closet, and now each week he's bringing you cool insights for loving and accepting yourself, boosting your self-confidence, and living a guilt-free, purpose-filled life on the other side of the closet doors. Cuddle up with yourself and get ready for heartwarming coming out stories, ideas for living authentically, and tips for being fully self-expressed. Now here's your host, Coming Out Coach Rick. Hey, 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 Closet Busters, you know what time it is. It's time to once again stop the closet dwelling and to step out, step up, and step into living your powerful truth. But you know what? Today, I want to talk about a truth that, oh man, I hope none of us ever have to face. But in order to get us into that space, I want you to imagine the following scenario. I want you to see yourself as being happily married You know, you really love your spouse and you yourself do some pretty beautiful work in advocacy for marriage equality and your husband is a chef. And between the two of you, you have three beautiful children that also get to share time with your husband's ex-spouse. But here's the deal. There's a story behind the story that's hiding in the closet. It's a story that's putting your children and their well-being at risk. Now, some of the story stems from a divorce that's suddenly gone really wrong And it's going awry each and every moment that ticks by. But there's something else hidden in this story that needs to come out of the closet and out of the closet fast for the well-being of your children. So here to share her coming out story and her real life adventure, and I hate to use the word adventure, but it's kind of a really crazy bad adventure that she's on right now. Here to share her story is someone that, well, someone that's really got something that needs to be shared because what's happening just isn't right. Her name is Julian Kelly, and she's going to talk about how court orders don't always mean you get what you need to be a good parent. Welcome to the podcast. How you doing? You know, I'm, I'm continuing to move forward. Yeah, yeah. So in order to give our listeners kind of a, a little bit more than beyond what I've already talked about, so let's kind of talk about you and your husband. Your husband's name is? My husband's name is Charlie, and Charlie is a chef, and I'm a fiction writer, cool. and uh, we live in Maryland, and we're just just kind of average people, you know, okay. just and just want to be how just want to be happy and want the normal things that sure. everybody else wants. And how long have you guys been together? We got married on October 23rd of 2010. But there's more to the story than before that marriage, correct? Well, yeah. (laughs) You guys have actually known each other quite a while, and you've actually been through some pretty big steps with Charlie, because Charlie wasn't always known as Charlie, was he? No. Charlie is transgender, and before Charlie became Charlie, he was Anissa. Hmm. And Anissa is actually the birth parent of those three lovely kids I talked about in the intro, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yes. And I know for some, this conversation may already be getting confusing a little bit. So obviously Anissa was a quote, born biological woman to anyone looking from the outside in when she had those children. But something tells me that like most trans people, she really never identified as a woman. Would that be correct, Julian? That's correct. I think my spouse worked really hard to try and fit in with heteronormative society and then just sort of said, okay, I need to be myself in order to be happy. And, you know, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So this is often what happens with our brothers and sisters who are transgender. They don't identify. They don't see that physical manifestation in the mirror that they identify with. But they often try to make it work and try to get by, much like most of us who are gay or lesbian as well. We just try to get by in some way until we just can't do this. So let's kind of roll back a little bit. You guys got married in 2010, but you've actually been together much longer than that, right? Well, we actually had a pretty quick engagement and courtship, I guess, if you want to call it that. But we fell in love pretty fast. I mean, I looked at Charlie and I saw a mirror of myself and his kindness and just these wonderful qualities about him just made him so, so, so irresistible to me. And very quickly, I couldn't envision my life without Charlie. And I know for a lot of people that are listening or that may listen to this episode, One of the first places I think a lot of people go in their mind 
is when they hear of a, quote, heterosexual person falling in love with a transgender person, the first place they want to go is, well, how does that work? I mean, that's just weird. That's, you know, what do you do in the bedroom? Blah, 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 blah. I bet that gets really frustrating for you, doesn't it? It does, because it's something that's just, you know, we just go about our lives, you know, just from day to day, like, you know, like normal people. And we don't think about those things until somebody confronts us with it. Yeah. So one of the questions I think to help clarify this for a lot of people would be, so when Charlie was, quote, Anissa, do you think Charlie would have identified as a lesbian? No, I really don't. Because I actually met Charlie before Charlie transitioned. Mm -hmm. And even before Charlie transitioned, he was like very masculine. And I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it was just, I guess, just like who he was, his soul, his personage, you know, just his essence. I didn't really look at him and think male, female. I just looked at him and saw Charlie. That was really it. I love that you just used the word essence because I know I speak on a lot of panels and had the beautiful opportunity to be around a lot of transgender individuals, both male and female. Mm -hmm. And I think essence is one of the words that doesn't get used enough, but I think really sums up how they feel that the essence of who I am is this. And, yeah. and I don't think they, number one, get the opportunity to express that the way they should pre-transition, depending on how deep their transition goes, because we heterosexuals, and I'm putting myself in this same space, even though I'm a homosexual gay man, I don't really think too much about the essence of who I am. I just am who I am. But there's something for our transgender brothers and sisters that the essence is the thing that is different. It's that essence of who they are. Because it doesn't start with their sexual orientation. It starts with how they identify. Yes. So you've been with Charlie. You've been through the transition. And you've also become a step-parent to these three children, correct? Yes. The three most amazing kids I've ever known. Yes. So how old were the kids when you guys got together? Just, you know, ballpark figures. They were like ballpark, three Ballpark. Teens? A little younger than that. Okay. Around that age. And for all intents and purposes, you know, you were just the new stepmom coming into the picture then, I would assume. Yeah, some things were a little different. We gave the children the option of who they wanted to tell about, you know, the nuances of our family. We felt that it was important to encourage them to be able to speak freely about us. But we also did not want to push that in such a way that felt uncomfortable for them. We really tried to instill in them that, you know, your family is the circle of people that love you and we're a family and we accept you for who you are and the world may not do that. So we tried to say, okay, you know, we want you to go out in the world and be exactly who you are, but also we want you to be safe. So, you know, that's kind of the way that we instructed them. Well, it sounds like a very beautiful way to instruct them. Why was it important to you and Charlie to approach it from that perspective? Well, it's interesting because from a personal perspective, I personally am, am really tired of having to legitimize my relationship to the heteronormative world that seems so ready to pass judgment on us for simply having the nerve to exist. But where my children are concerned, I'm concerned for their safety, for their well-being. And I also want to give them space to truly develop into the people that they feel that they are. So... I didn't feel like, you know, I didn't feel like it was really my place to say, you know, you have to tell everyone everything about your family. I felt like it was important to say, OK, we're here and we respect you and we love you unconditionally. And, you know, you go forth into the world and be the most authentic version of yourself that you can be and know that we're here at the end of the day. Sounds like a pretty good parent to me. We try. Well, and yeah. you know, I really heard you as you were just talking and when you used the terms, you know, not having to justify and legitimize my way of being here. 
because I think this is one of the most key critical things that those coming out of the closet, it doesn't matter, bisexual, gay, transgender, you know, any of the non-heteronormative ways of being in the sexual spectrum is Mm -hmm. why do we have to legitimize? Why do we have to do this? We're just human beings. Yet those of us who know at times we do have to legitimize this, it's because people are fearful. People are fearful of what they don't know. People are fearful of, you know, what they're not educated on. And I just want to honor what you and Charlie have done to really make this pathway as normative as can be for the kids, because that's what it's all about. It's about making it normative and showing your children, regardless of whether they're coming from a gay or lesbian environment or, you know, a heterosexual parent and a transgender parent. And, you know, in your kid's case, there's a biological parent involved here, too, that happens to be transgender. It's all of these things that by giving the kids the tools and the room and the opportunity to step into it in their own way and be comfortable in it in their own way is what parenting to me is all about. Yes. And now, you know, with the situation that that has come up, unfortunately, it's about protecting our children. But now we're in a position where we also want to say no more to these kinds of injustices. And, you know, we're ready to start protecting our legacy as LGBTQ people. Absolutely. And so I want to take the listeners into this current situation But I would like to invite them to remember what we've talked through up until this point. This is about a happily married couple who found love, who honor that love between them, who've created a family dynamic where kids are given the opportunity to be treated as human beings, as little adults that actually have minds of their own to function through what is, yes, a different normative to the rest of the world's families, so to speak, but also have been given all the love and support to truly come to parental people and say, I need help understanding this. I need help going through this. It sounds like to me all the groundwork has been laid from you and Charlie, Julian, yet now there's a whole nother dynamic happening. Yeah. It's completely putting your family and primarily your children at risk. So I want everyone to understand from this point forward in this conversation, if Julian doesn't divulge certain things, it is because she is currently in a legal battle that things that might get said could get misconstrued. So as the host of this show, I'm going to be very delicate in how I approach things. And I want Julian to feel very comfortable that if she chooses not to answer a question that comes up, that we all give her that understanding that this is because she's right now in the midst of a legal battle that has really turned ugly, ugly, ugly. Yes. So at this stage, I'm just going to come right out with it. You guys are in a battle to protect your children, aren't you? Yes, we are in a sense at war. Our middle child divulged to us that some abuses were occurring in the other parents' home. And immediately, as soon as we found out about this, I mean, we were devastated and we took immediate action to try and ensure their safety and their well-being. And we were granted by a Montgomery County, Ohio judge, which is where the children were residing in Ohio, in a different county, but still in Ohio, judge judge granted us a motion for temporary custody. It was an emergency motion for temporary custody, as well as a restraining order against the other parent. And, you know, when we found out what was happening in their household, we were shocked because these, you know, like you said, you know, we have created an environment where our kids come to us about things. And just the fact that, you know, that they were too fearful initially to speak about what was occurring with them was really, really flooring. But the moment that we found out what was happening, we tried to intervene to protect them. And the judge signed these orders. So we immediately, the next morning, got in the car and drove to Ohio to go and, you know, take custody of them, you know, so that they could be safe in our care. And we met with resistance that we did not expect at all. So before we get into the resistance piece, I'm going to interrupt here just for a minute. So... At this stage of the 
agreement between Charlie and the other parent, what are the custody arrangements? What, how are that laid out? Are they 50, 50? Is it, you know, hundred percent custody with visitation? What is it? Charlie had physical custody of the kids up until 2012. And then in 2012, things changed a little bit and the kids went to live with their other biological parent. And the terms of that agreement were shared parenting. The children were living there. That parent then had physical custody, but we had, you know, visitation and, you know, it wasn't laid out in the agreement that it was exactly 50-50. And we wanted it to be 50-50, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, the other parent is a Christian fundamentalist and is very, very against what we believe. So we've had some difficulties in maintaining regular contact with the children, but we're always doing that to the best of our ability. Okay, so I want to make sure that the listeners just heard, because I think this plays a key critical role in about what's going to be shared in the next few minutes, that you've tried to have a amenable relationship that there was a point when the children were under Charlie's custody, that there was a moment that things switched and the kids went back to custody with the other parent, which the other parent happens to be the biological father. And that relationship that parent has with them and the environment that they're being raised in, in your own words, is being raised in somewhat of a you know Christian environment. I want to make sure we get this picture painted very clearly here that fundamentalist Christian environment is, quote, the environment that supposedly the children are being surrounded by. So you guys get this information from your middle daughter about some alleged abuse things going on. You immediately go get a court order and make the moves to ensure safety of the children, which any logical parent in my mind would do. It's like my children are the most Okay, they are the most important thing, and that doesn't discount my spouse or ex-spouse, but those kids are my life, which any parent with any sense and heart and soul to me, that would be the move that be made, and that's exactly what you and Charlie did. So yes. now you made the move, you're on your way to get the kids to remove them from this alleged unsafe environment, yet for all intents and purposes... The environment's supposed to be a very fundamental Christian environment that would be safe for the kids. Yet when you go to get the kids, what started to unravel? Well, before we had actually arrived, we called the Dark County Ohio Sheriff's Department just to let them know that we were on the way, that we had our paperwork in order, and we were requesting an escort to the home for us to pick up the children. And on the phone, before they saw us, you know, there weren't any problems. There was no indication that there were going to be any complications with this at all. The sheriff's department said to meet in a parking lot, which was kind of across the street from the children's home. And we pulled up there and an older sheriff got out and he looked at Charlie in a way that I'll never forget. He gave him just a really strange look. And then he looked over at me And he said, which one of you is the parent? And Charlie said, I am. And he said, and and who is she? And pointed to me. And Charlie said, well, that's my wife. Then this sheriff, I mean, his face just, I wish I could completely capture for you with words the way he looked. But it was like he put up a wall immediately. He started rolling his eyes and grunting. And then he took our certified copies of the judge's order and he ordered us to get in our car. The sheriff later said to us that he didn't believe that these were legitimate certified, you know, court orders. He thought they were just falsified documents. He started accusing us of that. We were freaking out a little bit because, you know, this was something that was so unexpected. So we called our attorney and our attorney was just floored as well. So the that sheriff called for backup. And the backup came and the sheriff that came after that, he was a little nicer and he called the prosecutor and verified that, yes, these were, in fact, legal documents. And yes, in fact, the sheriff's department had an obligation to uphold the law. So 
they talked among themselves for a while and I could tell they were arguing about how to proceed. And eventually it was decided by the sheriffs they would take us to the children's home, but that they felt, you know, that it was best to just nicely ask the alleged abuser if he would, you know, agree to just give us the children of his own volition. On the way there, I remember thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. Why would you ask the alleged abuser's permission to relinquish the children when you have a court order that says that he no longer has any custody of them? But for the listener, what I want to make sure you're really capturing here, and Julian, you're just you're so beautifully painting the picture. But I want to bring up a couple of key points. So everything was fine when the communication was being given over the phone. Yes. And then suddenly, when someone actually saw the two of you, when the sheriff actually looked at these human beings, these two human beings that he's never met in his life before. Yes. Everything changed. And this is why I wanted this story to be on the Coming Out Lounge, because those of you who are going through these journeys, and I'm not saying all of you, I want to make sure I caveat that, but those of you who are going through these journeys may at some point in time have this exact kind of experience. Maybe it won't be because of abuse to children, but you will have this experience where everything seems fine until somebody actually sees you. And because of how you may present or because you may flip your hand in the air or the tone of voice you may consistently talk with, they will make a judgment and put you into a box and put you into that stereotypical box of Weirdo, freak, fag, queer, you know, freak of nature, transgender, whatever it is, because it's coming from their socialization and their belief system that they've been raised to believe. And there's not going to be anything in that moment you can actually do, even with a court order in hand, to change that person's perception of the world. Now, why do I bring that up? Because it's very critical to understand you cannot change their perception of the world in that moment. No matter how much you want to, no matter how much it's hurting you in that moment, there's nothing you can do because you are battling all of their life years on the planet of being socialized into their being and understanding that's happening in that moment. This doesn't make it right. doesn't make it excusable. I just want to make sure you understand in that moment, that person is dealing with the situation the only way they know how because of who they are and how they've been socialized. And it sucks. And it sucks really, really, really big. We had made certain to follow the law to the letter. I mean, to the letter. And it was heartbreaking to come to this instant realization that, yes, we have equality on paper, but not in practice. Okay, and this is important, too. What Julian just said is equality on paper, but not in practice. And I'm telling you folks that are listening, this happens every day all over the planet in every way. In fact, it's so frustrating to me as a gay man who came out late in life and has been through now two marriages, married to my husband, and to know that, thank God I live in California, where this bullshit can't go down this way, even though I know it could in some areas, even of progressive California folks. But it frustrates me to know that in some states, now that it is a federal law that gay marriage is recognizable under the Constitution, that I could get married in some states and go to work On that Monday, if I had a weekend wedding and be fired for being gay, this is where on paper, but not in practice comes into full play as Julian is sharing right now. So basically you had this beautiful piece of paper, but the law is not going to practice what's on that piece of paper. Yes, we had all of the legal documents in order. And instead, it seemed as though the police officers were against us and were actually siding with the alleged abuser in a very, very scary way. Now, I'm going to interrupt here just so people understand. The reason Julian is saying alleged abuser is because at this stage of the game, that's all that they can say. This person has not been convicted of abuse. This person has not been put through any kind of a legal, you know, microscope yet to prove this. So this is why she's using this terminology. 
So go ahead, Julian. So basically at the house, a series of events transpired and it became clear that the police were not going to enforce the judge's ruling. Instead, they circumvented the judge's ruling and more or less did everything in their power to ensure that we could not protect our children. And as if that wasn't bad enough, then the sheriff's department used that court order against us said, well, you're making all of these allegations in this signed court order and we want to investigate this. We want to, you know, we don't see any evidence here. So we're going to haul you off to the station for an interrogation. So we caravan. Basically, at this point, suddenly you go from being the saviors to the victims. Yes. Well, in the sheriff's eyes, I think we became, I think in the sheriff's eyes, we went from being the saviors to the criminals. Hmm. Uh, We went to be interrogated at this little interrogation center, and it was terrifying. I was detained in the parking lot because they didn't have enough interrogation rooms. My husband, Charlie, was pretty immediately taken in for interrogation, and he was in there, and he had been questioned intermittently throughout this whole process for at least five and a half hours. And the, you know, the sheriff inside was demanding proof, proof of these alleged abuses. And she said, well, you know, where's your proof? And Charlie said, well, the proof is with the judge who signed the order. You know, we created an evidence packet and that evidence packet went to the judge and the judge decided that they were going to seal that evidence packet for the children's safety and and autonomy. And they didn't want that to be a matter of public record because some of the text messages and images you know, or just really not appropriate for the public to have access to. So this interrogator was just going on and on. And from what I was told was threatening to throw Charlie in jail if Charlie didn't produce more evidence right away. And so Charlie had asked to call our attorney and was denied multiple times. And then finally they said, okay, you know, you can call the attorney, but it's got to be on speakerphone. So Charlie called the attorney. It was on speaker and the sheriff's department made it very clear that if our attorney didn't send over that evidence packet right then and there, that Charlie was going to be thrown in jail. So the attorney went and got the evidence packet and forwarded it, of course, by email. And we, uh, you know, I guess Charlie probably thought at this point, okay, maybe, maybe this will be enough and, you know, maybe I'll be able to protect the kids. But no, it didn't end there. The interrogator wanted to know where the real evidence was. And our phones were illegally confiscated and searched. My phone was confiscated and searched without even the signage of a search and seizure form. And they just... And while Charlie was in there getting interrogated, you know, hour after hour, the alleged abuser, I watched him, was in the parking lot deleting things off of his cell phone. I watched it happen. He was moving about freely and there was, you know, nobody was watching him. He had full license to do whatever he wanted to do. And Charlie was the one in that cell being subjected to question after question after question. So I know for some listening to this that maybe they'd say, okay, but how do you know that's exactly what he was doing, Julian? But I also want to beg those that may be having that kind of question going off in their mind. How do you know that it isn't what he was doing? I mean, the thing is, is there's been a chain of evidence at this point submitted of these alleged abuse scenarios. It's been put under lock and key to protect the children. You're in this situation, and I want everyone to think about if this were, okay, let's just, and I'm not saying it couldn't happen if it was, but let's just put this in a slightly different situation. Let's just say, and something that hasn't come up yet, is that Charlie, for all intents and purposes, may not physically manifest quite as masculine as a heteronormative, born biological, masculine male in most people's eyes. I'm just going to put it out there because Julie and I already talked about it. That's kind of one of the reasons this probably all started. Yes. However, if this were a, quote, normal divorce situation where a heteronormative couple had been going through this exact same scenario with the heteronormative couple who's now divorced and moved on, remarried, and this thing was happening I want everybody to imagine, much like what's going on with our African-American brothers and sisters in our nation today, 
I want you to wonder, would this same conversation be happening? Yes, it possibly could. But I doubt that if a heteronormative couple showed up and said, we've got this court order, they look like a guy, they look like a girl, they look quote unquote normal in that person's judgmental eye, I don't believe we would even be having this conversation on this podcast today. And I'm sure that's how you feel, Julian, isn't it? Absolutely. So let's kind of cut to the chase here. At this point... You guys are hands tied, literally, probably, figuratively both. And those children are still not in your custody. They're still not. During the interrogation process, the children were allowed to speak with their alleged abuser. They were not allowed to speak with Charlie, who actually is the legal parent at this time. Charlie wasn't even allowed to hold them, to hug them, to say, I love you. Nothing. So I'm curious. Here's your biological parent. I don't give a damn if that parent doesn't look like the parent they knew. Because the kids have been through the transition as well. They've seen the parent transition. Yes. But if your kids are standing there and you can't even touch or hold these kids... I just want people to think about how much damage is this doing to those kids and their mindset? How much is this bringing up something that could truly, and excuse my French, f*** these kids up for a very long time? This is a parent who loves and cares for their children. This is a parent who has taken every precaution as they've come into their own truth to ensure that they give their children the most space and love and understanding to kind of go through this journey in their own way. There's been no forced way of doing any of this yet because someone else has decided that they just don't quite fit the mold of what a freaking man should look like, that they're going to exercise their own narrow-minded right to go up against the law. And unfortunately, it was the sheriff's department that was circumventing the judge's ruling. Absolutely. It's so, so sad. So rather than protecting our children and protecting their rights and our rights, the sheriff's department actually decided to hand them back to the very alleged abuser that, you know, we're trying to protect them from. And without going into any detail, I'm going to fill in a little bit of the blanks. And, you know, Julie and I have had some pre-conversations about where we were going to go on this podcast. But I can tell you that some of the stuff that she shared with me about the alleged abuse would turn most people's stomachs. It would just, it would break your heart that somebody with such a narrow mind would go, well, it's better for them to be with that person than to be with loving parents, yet that one parent doesn't look like a man. So it's probably not good for them to be there. And I can tell you that if you know the background of this story, And I don't really want to have Julian have to go live through that at this stage. But if you had to know what's going on in that household, I can guarantee you as a life coach, and I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, but I've talked with people through different things. And I can tell you this, what's happening to those kids is going to be far, far, far more devastating to them in their own beautiful ability to love themselves and be psychologically balanced than it will be, than it will be for them to go be with Charlie and Julian. Yeah. So the reason I brought Julian on this show, number one, is because of this story. Because I want to be a voice that can help these kind of individuals get their story heard. But I also wanted to share, we're not really as far as we think we are, folks. We're not nearly as far as we should be as a humanity that these kind of situations continue to happen, that kids can be put into situations where there's two loving individuals who want to take care of them in healthy ways that say, we're just a who we are. As Julian said, we just kind of do our life. We don't do anything out of the ordinary. We get up, we fix breakfast, we do the things we're supposed to do. We just live life. Yet, yet, choices get made that say you're not good enough. Yes. So at this stage, I know you're in the legal battle of everything still, trying to get those kids into a much better environment. 
And what's on the horizon? Well, we've encountered a lot of resistance, but we've also encountered a lot of support from the LGBTQ community. And it has really helped us to feel as though we're strong enough to put our foot down on this and say, you know what, enough is enough. We will not be silenced. We will not be intimidated. And we will fight for the rights of our children. And we are unafraid of those who stand on the wrong side of history. And we have people that have been calling the Ohio Attorney General's office on our behalf. And those calls are so, so appreciated. One of our children actually is on the LGBTQ spectrum, which kind of also adds another dimension to this. And Charlie and I feel, we feel like, you know, our families are are the bedrock of our communities. And if we can't protect our children, we have nothing. We have nothing. And I think... I think one thing with this that's really important for people to understand is we can't overlook the urgency to act quickly and decisively because gradualism does not work. And it just simply ensures that minorities suffer a slow, excruciating death without political accountability and without consequences for those who seek to destroy our communities. So at this point, Julian, the only thing I can say is, first of all, my heart goes out to you guys. And I feel very privileged that this is the beauty of the internet and being able to make connections. I don't know how you found me, but I'm glad you did. I remember opening the email and going, oh, I've got somebody who contacted me on my website contact form. And that typically means somebody who's reaching out saying, hey, I need help coming out of the closet or, hey, I'd like to have you speak or I want to be on your podcast, which this happened to be. I want to be on your podcast. And I'm like, cool. I'm always looking for, you know, very, you know, which is very powerful guests with wonderful stories. And I have to say, as tragic as this story is and continues to be, this is a wonderful story because these stories need to be brought to life. They need to come to the center and the forefront of our society more and more and more and more. The only way to close a closed mind is to open a closed mind. Rick, the situation has made me think a lot. And today in particular, I did a lot of thinking about Martin Luther King Jr. this week. And as an LGBTQ person, it made me think, you know, I have a dream also. I have a dream that no more LGBTQ people commit suicide because we feel so deeply that our society hates us. And I dream that our families and children are no longer relegated to a permanent exile within our own society. And, you know, that religion is no longer used to turn brother against brother, but rather enemies into friends. And I'm dreaming right now for an end to this persecution and for a nation that is whole and safe for all of us, my children included. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting, Julian, because I typically ask at the end of each show, you know, what would you what would you want to say to somebody who's struggling? You just said it about let's bring this hope let's stop this madness let's realize you can survive you will survive and that's my hope and prayer for you and your family and so if someone wanted to be of support how can they start to support you know who can they call who can they contact what can we do in these last minute or so before we wrap up this episode Well, calls to the Ohio Attorney General would be appreciated. I can give you the number. The number is 614-446-4986. That's 614-466-4986. And then also we created a GoFundMe account because unfortunately with long legal battles like this one, it's just a reality that funds are a necessity and we certainly don't want to have to drop out of things or not be able to file motions or not be able to do things that we really need to do because of a lack of funds. So we created a GoFundMe and it's GoFundMe backslash save our kids LGBT. That's GoFundMe backslash Save Our Kids LGBT. Awesome. Thank you for just sharing yourself, your story, for being here and helping us see just once again, our fight is still a fight no matter how far we've come. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. You know what? I typically end the shows with, you know, if you've really enjoyed what you've heard, and I'd have to say you probably haven't enjoyed what you've heard today. 
But if you give a damn, I really this time encourage you from the bottom of my heart to go give our podcast, the Coming Out Lounge podcast, a rating and a review and talk about how these issues are showing up so that people who are struggling, who are hiding their truth, who are being persecuted in different ways for just being human. Man, if you can give us those kind of ratings and review and say, there's hope, listen to this. I learned something from this. This will help us get these stories and this kind of message out into the world. And that's all it's about this time. I don't even want to talk about anything else because I want this show to literally just sink in. And I want you to take the time and however you feel you can support Julian and Charlie and their kids to just, even if it's just a matter of reflection and prayer and hoping and wishing and calling upon a higher power to do something on their behalf. If that's all you can do, I know it will be greatly appreciated. And with that, I'm going to just quietly sign off today and say thank you for listening to the Coming Out Lounge. You've just experienced the Coming Out Lounge. Go online to www.comingoutlounge.com to learn more. And tune in again next week for more stories and tips for being true to yourself. 